Hello everyone, I hope that you're all doing well. In this video, I want to talk about a recently published book called Social Chemistry. The subtitle of the book is Decoding the Patterns of Human Connection. The book is written by Marisa King, who is a professor of organizational behavior at Yale University. The book was published November last year, so just two months ago. In this video, I will first begin with a very brief overview of the book, what the book is about. Then I will mention a few things that I really liked about the book. And at the end, I will include a few minor criticisms. Because I just finished reading the book, it might take some more time for me to formulate a deeper critical response to the book. But for now, I'll just mention a few things. In general, I really like the book. I think the book is very useful in some ways, very instructive and illuminating. So first, uh, let's begin. What is the book about? The book is about human relationships and human networks and how our actions, your action, my actions, result in changes in our networks. So the properties of our networks, have the dynamic formation of our networks, change based on our actions. And then in turn, the properties of our networks influences has consequences on us, various consequences, including our, our well-being, our work, our capacity for problem solving, uh, how we feel, do we feel connected or disconnected. So this is obviously an important topic and relevant to all of us. But this is the kind of topic that we often don't have the right approach and right perspective on. You know, some topics are like that. They are very deeply relevant to all of us, but we have usually the wrong attitude and wrong perspective. We are maybe too immersed in the topic and not objective, not distant enough to have, a, have an objective viewpoint on the, on, on the topic. So most of us, because we don't have the right perspective and we haven't carefully and systematically thought about relationships and networks, we have certain biases in our thinking about relationships and networks. And those biases can result in either mistakes, sometimes mistaken thought, belief, or mistaken action, or inaction. Sometimes our biases might prevent us from doing something that is very useful and the right thing to do for us. What are some of these biases that we, we might have? For example, we underestimate, we might underestimate how much control we have, how much control we can have, we can exert over our relationships and over our social networks. We, we might accept our situation, our, our, the cir circumstances, and we might appeal to our personality, our, our personality traits, which we might believe to be stable, stable traits. And we might say things like, I'm an introvert or I'm shy, I'm not good at networking. And these kinds of beliefs might result in inaction, passive acceptance of an undesirable situation. Next, we might underestimate how common these networking problems and networking worries and concerns are. It's not unique to, to me, it's not unique to you. These are worries and concerns and discomforts that many, many experience and report, especially when they are asked by researchers. For example, people generally feel dirty and a certain the sense of a sense of unpleasantness about instrumental networking. So instrumental networking or functional sociability is when we interact with somebody, but with a purpose, we have an ulterior motive. Most people feel dirty about this, not just about doing it, but about being perceived as engaged in that instrumental networking. So this is a widespread concern and worry. This book, Social Chemistry, attempts to bring an unbiased perspective, which is to say, there's an unbiased perspective usually means perspective that is based on multiple perspectives. So this book is an attempt to bring an unbiased perspective into this very important topic. Marisa King, the author, introduces a few core concepts at the outset and then spends some time elaborating why these concepts are useful, why they can organize our thinking about social networks. These concepts include the three styles of developing social networks. So a person in their lives, in their career, or in their social life, they can engage in three distinct styles of developing their network. These three styles are called expansion. And expansion means growing lots of relationships. So imagine a graph. At once, at the center, it's you, or the main agent that we are talking about. And then there are branches out of that center into each distinct relationship. The second style is called convening. Here, somebody who convenes strengthens the network as a, as a totality, as an entirety. The, the entirety of the network becomes stronger because of the convener. And third and last, we have brokerage. A broker, what they do is that they connect distinct groups. They act as the middle person connecting networks that might not otherwise have anything to do with each other. So that is a creative, socially creative act and can result in creative ideas. 
So after introducing and elaborating these core concepts, the author goes through a series of related topics. Each topic addresses, tackles a side of networking and social relationships. These topics, just to name a few, they include self-impression, how we think about ourselves and the ways in which we could be correct or incorrect. The topic of friendship, trust is discussed. The role of vulnerability, the, ne the necessary role of being vulnerable, actively vulnerable uh, as, a, as a way of developing and deepening friendship. Topics like creativity in work and ideas is discussed. Use of cell phones and how they interfere with intimacy is discussed. Mistakes as, a, as an important topic. Mistakes, not just mistakes that a person makes, but mistake and erroneous judgment, erroneous decision as a property of a network, as, a, as an action, as something that happens in a group. A group makes a mistake sometimes. And related to that is the concept of psychological safety. When people don't feel safe in a group, they usually don't express uncertainty. They don't let each other know that they might be making a mistake. And the interplay between professional and personal life, a chapter is devoted to that, the, the relationship between professional life, work, and personal life, and how the domains of work and rest of life, family life, personal life, friendships, those two might remain separate in some people, and for some people, they, they converge, and they're, they're more connected. The book also discusses things that happen from moment to moment, the details of social interaction, including eye contact and physical touch. Now, what I liked about this book, Social Chemistry, the personal side stories that the author shares with us are quite good. I think they really contribute to the content of the book. I really enjoyed them. The story about the, the challenge with teaching, the experimentation that the author talks about how she tried different personas, different kind of personality types, projecting personality types to get the attention and trust of the, the students and that how that could backfire. And these stories showed the author had a personal involvement and investment in the, the problems discussed in the book, the topics in the book. Because the book offers a careful, systematic study, it brings, brings out a few counterintuitive ideas and insights. So these include the value of, she talks about how it is really valuable to have acquaintances. We usually intuitively, we have this bias that our friends are valuable to us. What is important is our friends, mostly acquaintances don't matter, but there is value to having acquaintances or in the language of the language that described networks and graphs, uh, it is the, it's called the loose ties, not strong ties, but loose ties. These loose ties, acquaintances can have really unpredictable value and effects in our lives. Another counterintuitive idea is uh, the fact that we underestimate our, our likability. After a conversation with a stranger, usually the average person underestimates how much the other person likes them. And this is explained in terms of the felt sense of inauthenticity. Because we realize that we are acting a little bit differently compared to our usual self when we are talking to a stranger, this results in this signal of inauthenticity results in our underestimation of, of, of ourselves. Similarly, we underestimate our social life. If you ask most people, despite having a huge self-serving bias in most other domains like driving skills, IQ, in many other domains, we have a self-serving bias. We think that we are above average. But in social life and in social networks, most of us have the tendency to believe that we are doing worse than the other people. And this is also explained, it makes sense because we pay more attention to the relatively more popular, relatively more sociable people and that attention, that uneven attention given to the more sociable people skews and biases our perception and our self-judgment. Similarly, people overestimate their listening skills. If you ask, most people will tell you that they are great listeners, but uh, of course that's not true. One last thing I mentioned that I really liked about the book, and that's the, the difference between mentors and sponsors. I learned that for me, my relationship with my PhD advisor wasn't really according to the terminology in this book, it was not mentorship. It was more like sponsorship. So the difference between a mentor and a sponsor is that a sponsor is somebody who publicly endorses you. A sponsor, in addition to being a mentor, uses their reputation and uses their social capital to enhance your reputation and enhance your career. So in general, the distinctions, the concepts introduced in the book are quite useful. They stimulate thinking about the topic, topics related to relationships and networking. And they take us in directions that we wouldn't go without these ideas, without these concepts. All right, finally, some criticism, some light criticism of the, of the book. My major criticism isn't directed exclusively at uh, Professor Marisa King. It is applicable more widely in, in the field of organizational behavior, social psychology, which is closer to my field, 
economics and similar fields. In these fields, the problem, a very common problem, is that the distinction between two very important things that should be distinguished, they are very different, but the distinction between the two is not usually recognized and is not kept in mind. So what are those two things that we should, we should separate? On the one hand, we have the objects of our study, the phenomena, the thing that is at stake, the thing that we are interested in understanding here is human relationships or human networks. On the other hand, we have our concepts, our hypotheses, our models that we use to make sense of those objects and phenomena, the processes. So the objects of our study should be distinguished from the methods that we use, the concepts, the constructs, hypotheses, models, metaphors. It is worth emphasizing, it should be emphasized, that the central constructs in this book, like the people who being described as expansionists, brokers, conveners, these are models. These are very useful uh, metaphors, analogies. They are not things. There is no such a thing as a convener. It's not a personality type. It's not a type of person. Are useful ways of describing changes in network properties based on actions. Another problem with these fields, again, general problem, not specific to this book, but in fields like organizational behavior, social psychology, there's always the possibility of pseudo-empirical research. What is pseudo-empirical research? It is a research that collects lots and lots of data that is not necessary. So we collect lots of data, usually questionnaire or re reports, in order to support a claim that is a logically necessary claim. So for example, people who are expansionists, people who make lots of contacts with lots of other people tend to get tired because they do more work. So that is, seems to be something that is logically necessary by just by accepting the meaning of our concepts, it follows from what we already accept. Axiomatically, it follows. It doesn't require any further empirical observation. So that's just a, one example. If you'd like to read more about this kind of research mistake, there's a really nice book edited by Tobias Lindstad called Respect for Thought. I would highly recommend that. And hopefully, at some point in the future, I will discuss that the collection. And finally, this book, Social Chemistry, has attempted to do something very difficult. What it has tried to do is to appeal to two types of reader, the general reader and the specialist reader. So the book contains an extensive review of the relevant literature. And the extensiveness of that review makes it seem like the book is intended for specialist readers. But at the same time, the empirical research is not discussed critically. We don't read in the book that this is the findings, but the findings are open to multiple different interpretations, or there were some problems with the interpretation of these findings, or maybe there is some mistake or, you know, the issue of replicability is not discussed in the book. So this, this uncritical treatment of the empirical research makes it seem like the book is intended for the general readership, and maybe this was the original and sole intention of the book. So these criticisms aside, uh, I would recommend this book, and it at least gives us a really good starting point for thinking more carefully and more systematically about networks and about social relationships and taking a more active role in these domains. All right, thank you very much for your attention and I will talk with you in the next video.